I'm so happy to be here. And uh, I'm an historian. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> so I will bring you in a journey through time. But before leaving, uh, I must tell you something about uh, some terms I will use. Okay. The terms, the principal terms are taste and appetite. Taste is to like something. Appetite is to desire something, to be driven, to be pushed towards it, because we suppose we will like it. The latent origin of this name is appetere, to desire. But who is this driver? Who drives us to desire something? Why do we think that we shall like it? Different answers have been given to this question. Different ideas have been historically elaborated. Generally speaking, we can distinguish between answers of two main kinds, stressing either on culture or nature. Two terms to be intended both, between inverted commas, because both of them are cultural ideas, cultural choices, cultural values. As nature, I mean the idea, the cultural idea, that our appetite our desire of eating is driven by a sort of internal biological instinct. As culture, I mean the idea that it is driven by information we learn outside as the society where, where we were grown and its values. Both drivers usually work interacting, which is other but the emphasis on the first or the second is different according to cultures, societies, ages. What I call medieval appetite is the, the fact that in the Middle Ages, scientific treatises stress the importance of nature as the driver of appetite. Appetite, therefore, taste, is thought as something natural to the single eater. Each one has his own natural appetite, determined by his own physical needs. Appetite is the expression of a need. Uh, there is uh, a sentence uh, of uh, Salerno School of Medicine, 13th century, that tells, uh, through your desire, you will be able to understand your need. I go to introduce another topic about how flavors were intended in pre-modern science. According to the works of Hippocrates and Galen, the ancient founders of Western medical philosophical tradition and their medieval continuers, a flavor is never an occasional accidental attribute, but it's related to the nature of a product, to its qualities and nutritional values. Um, the distinction between accident and substance make reference to Aristotle's philosophy, that is the reference for all ancient and medieval science. Accordingly, you can recognize nutritional qualities simply by tasting something. And this can be done just in one way, eating. Meeting your appetite, your desire of a food with the food's flavor. 
matching the subject with his needs and desire to the object with its qualities and flavors. Possible result of this meeting can be pleasure or displeasure. According to medieval physicians, tasting something good, that is, uh, feeling pleasure in eating, is the proof that food is good for you in that precise moment. In this perspective, pleasure is the way to health. I give you two quotations by medieval Italian physician. The first one is uh, by Aldo Brandino from Siena, 13th century. As Avicenna said, Avicenna is uh, an, a famous Arab commentator of Aristotle, all things that give the mouth a better flavor are the ones that better nourish the body. The second quotation is by another physician from Milan, Maino Maineri, 14th century. By means of condiments, dishes become better to taste, therefore, therefore, more digestible. In fact, the more you like a food, the more it is good for digestion. Let's summarize this biological mechanism. On one hand, we have the object, an edible thing characterized by a specific quality and flavor. The letter, the flavor, expression of the former, the quality. On the other hand, we have the subject, a possible eater characterized by specific needs and desire or appetite. The latter, appetite, expression of the former need. The meeting between object and subject is the experience of eating. Pleasure is the evidence that desire, then need, have been satisfied by flavor, then quality. This pleasure is the evidence that they did not fit. In post-medieval times, the so-called modern age, since the 16th century on, a significant change happens in the way of thinking, taste, and appetite. Now they are thought more as a cultural construction than a natural attitude, with the ambiguity that I noticed. Therefore, taste can be learned, can be teached, the concept of a good taste is born, what we call in Italian buon gusto. Accordingly, a bad taste can exist, something that medieval culture hesitated to admit, preferring to think that every, every taste is good and uh, about tasted, you cannot dispute. De gustibus non est disputandum was the Latin sentence. On the contrary, the good taste can be disputed as it is conceived as a collective matter. Over time, this idea shall overcome the medieval concept of a taste as an individual matter. And uh, with the diffusion of this concept, the figure of the critic is born, the expert who sets the pace, who shows the right way to eat. At this point, appetite can become a matter of study. Let me introduce a 16th century quotation from Michel de Montaigne, describing a conversation he had with the housemaster of Cardinal Carafa in Rome a man that appears extremely careful on gastronomy and uh, an art and a science. He told me about the difference of appetites, the one you have when fasting, 
before eating, the one you have after a first or a second meal, the ways to simply satisfy it or to awaken it and excite it, the technique of sauce, the differences of salads according to the season, which one must be served hot and which one cold, the manners to get them nice to the eyes too. After that, he went to the rules of serving with fine and important considerations, rich and magnificent words, the same you could use when treating how to govern an empire. You can note that in this passage, Montaigne is quite critic about the excessive, he thinks, attention Italians give to gastronomy and cooking. Anyway, we feel that something during these centuries has changed. Appetite is no more considered as a natural, biologic altitude, but uh, as a cultural, social matter. Now a question. What kind of cook will better fit in these two different ways of, king, of thinking of conceiving appetite. What I call medieval cooks is a, a figure that emerges from uh, medieval recipe books uh, written by professionals. These books su suggest that uh, the best qualities for a cook should be knowledge of animals and plants' nature skill, ability in cooking techniques, creativity, inventiveness. I have uh, here quoted from an Italian cookbook of the 14th century, the good cook shall be competent in everything according to the diversity of reigns and shall be able to vary the shapes, flavors, and colors of dishes according to his will. But all these skills and capacities are intended to be at service of the eater's taste. As appetite is individual, the eaters, each one of them, will be responsible for their choice, an individual one. In fact, medieval table service was never intended to be the same for all. Different dishes were posed on the table simultaneously, so each one could pick up what his appetite was demanding. Something like, still today happens in some Chinese tradition. I will return on this. Knowledge, skills, creativity always remain the most appreciated qualities for a cook. But since the 17th century on, the cook himself, when writing a recipe book, declares, claims his good ideas, his good taste, pr proposing it uh, to his uh, readers or customers or uh, lords. The cook is not yet a free professional. This will be possible only since the 19th century with the appearance of the first public restaurants. But even as a home servant, even as a dependent of a lord, the cook can be an expert that supports the superiority of his theoretical principles. In the 17th century, some French cooks introduce in their recipe books a preface that declares their ideas, usually claimed as new. Nouvelle cuisine is not, has not been born in the 20th century. I give you an example from a book by Nicolas de Bonfons who claims that each product must keep its natural taste. 
A cabbage soup must taste of cabbage. A leek soup must taste of leek. A soup of turnip must taste of turnip. It is not an obvious speech. It's uh, an actual ideological manifesto against the tendency of old cuisines to valorize artifice. More and more since then, and uh, mainly in the last uh, century, cooks aim to be and to be recognized not only as uh, good technicians, but uh, also as uh, uh, the makers of ideas, values, uh, life models, the inventors of uh, French Nouvelle Cuisine in the 70s could still stress their practical skill, the capability to manage their work uh, at the highest level. After that, the Spanish wave has gone far beyond this perspective, assuming that a cook can offer a total experience, both sensory and intellectual, building bridges and links uh, with uh, visual arts and other forms of creativity, music included. More recent tendencies are under our eyes, with cooks uh, proposing new kinds of relationship with nature, new ethical looks, and attention to the environment, and so on. All this confirms the figure of a cook setting the pace, suggesting the eaters an actual philosophy of life. I think these developments are rich in significance and uh, go in a right direction. But I would express a duped, a dubbed. In front of this generation of cooks, uh, of this actual maître à penser, who propose not only foods and flavors, but ideas, values, and so on, what is the role of the eater? Compared with his medieval ancestors, doesn't he run the risk to depend too strictly on uh, cooks, tasters, and rules? Is he still master of his appetite? Obvious, obviously, he is uh, totally free to choose where to eat, which gastronomic and cultural proposal, which philosophy to share with the cook. But in the meal itself, what happens? So, as you see, I am ending with a little provocation. Would it be possible for this new generation of cooks to experiment, a sort of new interactivity with their customers, I mean interacting with them in the making of their dish, something like the cooking at table evoked a few minutes ago by Professor Rosen, but on a higher level. When I wrote this note uh, the day before yesterday, I thought this was a sort of boutade. Then I listened to Shinichiro Takaji telling how he changes his dishes and menus according to the person that enters his restaurant, asking for uh, his origin, tastes, and so on before beginning to cook for him. I thought this is a sort of uh, medieval culture still alive, still alive uh, not for chance, in Eastern cultures that share with our Western Middle Ages many scientific and philosophical references. Above all, the idea that uh, individuals are different from each other and require their own diet because they have their own appetite. So I thought that 
as someone said yesterday here, nothing is impossible except Italy winning the European Football Championship. <laughs> except this. One possible answer to my impossible question could involve the manners of serving at table, proposing collective, not individual dishes, so to promote both conviviality and the possibility for each one to compose his own dish according to his appetite, to decide what to eat, how much to eat. I mean a sort of open service, as it was in the Middle Ages, as it is still today, but only on a low quality level in, mem in many popular traditions, in the buffet, buffet pattern or the breakfast, or I quote Rosen again, composing your dish, cooking a table, adding salt, adding vinegar, fast food style. Today, all this only happen in a very low style, even trash experience. Could we imagine to replace this style, this ancient style, in high cuisine too? I see this is not a simple proposition when a cook has been recognized as an artist who composes his dish as a picture to be admired in shape and colors beyond taste and flavors. But, but, uh, but res respecting the cook as an artist, I wonder whether it'd be possible to think a dish not as a perfect masterpiece, perfect in the Latin sense of perfectum, accomplished, completed, but as an open artwork to be completed by the eaters themselves, giving them, for example, several possibilities among which to choose involving in some way clients in the realization of the dish, as many modern artists do, leaving the public to complete their work. I'm not a cook, so I really don't know how to do it, or even if it would be possible. I'm afraid this is up to you. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, have a chance to ask questions. Just, just a, a, a little housekeeping note. If you're leaving the tent, can you just do it as quietly as possible? Or if you're coming back in, I know it's squeaky timber, but just try and be as quiet as possible. And if you're standing outside of the perimeter of the tent, you can hear talking inside. So let's just try and keep it as quiet I, as possible. I am not Montari, eh? I am Montanari. Someone is lacking. Okay, well, uh, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be dealt with by René very soon, I think. Um, and I am yeah. too fat there. Uh, that, <laughs> that, uh, I, uh, I didn't personally draw that, but we will, uh, <laughs> we'll find out, find out who did. I think they, they've already left the building. Um, a fabulously interesting talk about how the eater can have maybe more control and uh, uh, how you create a new interactivity between the customer and the cook. And of course, it, it fits in with a new way of uh, living our lives in an open world where our social lives are open, the science is open, and indeed journalism is open. Um, so let's see who would like to explore those ideas with um, Massimo. I'm uh, having a bit trouble phrasing it, but um, uh, the, um, my question would be kind of, 
in these, these times of crisis, or uh, as one also could say, depropriation of many people uh, who don't have much money anymore. Do you suppose one could say that we are actually also in Europe in a new middle age as only an elite has the possibility to give themselves into the hand, for example, of Ferran Adria or of René, and for the many others who don't have uh, the chance of making enough money to come uh, and eat in, uh, in these, uh, to go to a food concert, they'll be forever content to not uh, have access to this kind of art. So are we living in a new middle age already, gastronomically? And is this, uh, this, this word, this, this way um, you, you, you imagined um, of um, seeing art, um, seeing food as a new art, a way of trying to make it more accessible again? Well, I think you are uh, using the, the concept of Middle Ages in, in, in a way a little bit negative that I don't uh, agree, of course. But uh, uh, your, your question is interesting. I, I think that uh, um, the difference, uh, the social difference in uh, food habits in the Middle Ages was very high. There were much uh, differences. Uh, food was an actual social status of, of, of the persons. But uh, uh, the kind of culture that I have a little briefly described uh, was socially shared. I mean that it was written by scientists, by dietitians, by cooks, uh, and obviously it was not written for the peasants, but only for the rich, for the lords. But the type, the kind of, of um, ideas uh, that uh, shaped this culture was widely shared by population, even in the lower classes. Uh, I make you an example, uh, as uh, uh, Jean-Louis Flandrin noted, uh, there is a, a, a link, a strict link between the ideas we find uh, in scientific treatises and some proverbs that uh, are, have been, uh, have been uh, uh, brought uh, to popular tradition. And um, m many of uh, the, the practices uh, we find on the rich banquets uh, of, a cor of a court uh, uh, can be described in different ways, but with a similar methodology in popular meal. So what I, uh, perhaps, what I uh, was going to suggest uh, in my presentation was to recuperate uh, in uh, our modern culture, in our modern food habits, uh, this sort of social, wide, wide social sharing of uh, habits uh, that have been totally separated. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, uh, popular traditions based on uh, um, the idea that the eater makes his dish. On the other hand, we have a, a, a very high level gastronomy where the cook is a sort of artist. These two images are very, very far from each other today. I wonder if it would be possible to, to get them together in the same way as they were in the Middle Ages. That was perhaps the sense of what I said. Uh, we uh, have time for just one uh, question, but it really needs to be a, a very quick answer as well. Quick. Quick, quick question. Uh, uh, one over here, sorry. I was very interested in what you were saying about how, um, about flavor and taste and nourishment, and particularly a lot of East Asian cultures and Italians, like they love, they long for the bitter taste. They have an appetite for bitter taste. And a lot of modern cuisine we've gone, seem to have gone, particularly in America, towards sweet and bland. Do you have any comment on that? And socialization and how we've gotten away from, from our appetite for these tastes. 
What is the question? <laughs> well, to say really shortly, do you have a comment on the flavor bitter and an appetite for bitter Yes, taste? I know that bitter is a, a, a typical flavor for Italians. Uh, I, I, as, as a historian of the Middle Ages, of the medieval culture, I would say that in medieval thought and cooking practices, uh, they thought that uh, a perfect dish must contain all flavors, because each flavor reveals, uh, expresses uh, a quality. And then if you put all flavors in a dish, you have all qualities in the food you are eating. Uh, I don't know why Italians love bit, bitter, bitter taste. I don't know. But uh, uh, surely uh, the medieval eaters uh, loved uh, to put even bitter in, in, the, in a dish with acid, with uh, sour, with uh, sweet. And uh, Professor Rosen uh, asked uh, some minutes uh, ago why we put uh, a dessert at the end of a meal. This problem did not exist for medieval people because they put the sweet everywhere from the beginning to the end, but mixed with salted, mixed with sour, mixed it with bitter, mixed it with everything. And I think that this kind of uh, um, aesthetics of food can be better understood today by people of the Eastern culture, because in China, in Japan, in India, this kind of uh, ideas are still alive. Thank you.